everyone. Welcome to Women in Water Podcast. I'm your host, Sue Lap Pew, and I'm here to bring you the inspiring story of the incredible women who are making a difference in the water sector. Today, we have a very special guest who will take us on an incredible journey through her experiences and expertise in the world water. Hello, Peter. Welcome to the show. We are honored to have you here, and we can't wait to learn from your wisdom and experience. Thank you for joining us on this podcast journey as we continue to celebrate the power of women in the water sector. Yes, thank you, Sula. Good to see you. Um, I'm Vera, Vera Lagendijk, but usually I just use my first name, Vera, because that's easiest. I'm a project manager. I work for VEI, so that's Dutch Water Utilities. And um, currently I'm, uh, I'm working in, in Africa, in Malawi, um, but I also worked in Myanmar, which is why I know Sula. Yeah, I think that we have known each other since 2018, I guess. She's also my wonderful project manager, and it is really nice to be working with you, Vera. As we are working in the water sector, I'm really curious to know that what does water mean to you? We always say water is life, but water is also fun. Um... For me, water is something I've always had around me growing up in the Netherlands. Uh, water is everywhere. Uh, we used to learn to swim at a very young age. And during my study, a big part of my study was revolved around water. And now it's my work. So water is everything. Yes, I totally agree with you. Without water, there's no life. So water is everything. Um, by the way, how did you get into the water sector? Yeah, I, 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 I thought about that when you asked me the question. <laughs> And um, it's a little bit by coincidence, I think, though maybe it's not. Um, as I said, water has always been a part of my life. It's always been close by. And um, part of my study was around water as well. I never imagined I would actually work in the water sector, but my first job application was at uh, Dutch water utility, Fitens, and um, they, uh, they asked if, uh, if I could work as a, as a hydrologist. And I thought I should be able to do that because I had a little bit of hydrology in my study and I knew a little bit about programming. And well, I mean, I thought as a first job, it's nice. And I never left um, because it was so much fun working with water, doing calculations and later on moving into management positions. Um, so it hasn't been a very conscious decision working in the water sector, but staying there has been a very conscious decision because as soon as you start working in the water sector, you see how, how important it is and also how much work there needs to be done um, to make sure that people get good, clean drinking water. Um, so the decision to stay within the water sector has always been a very conscious one. And especially now, since I started working abroad um, in developing countries, you see how difficult people, um, how difficult life can be if there's no good water around and how sometimes only small things can make a big difference. So now working in this sector, it's like, it's my thing. But starting out, I never thought I would be working in the water sector, but yeah, so that's a little bit of a coincidence, but staying, it's not. Yeah. Yes, I can totally relate about that. There's also an inside joke in the water sector that if you are in the water sector, you will never leave. So it's more like the water people thing. Once you get in, you don't you don't leave. No, it's true. Yeah. I think I think it goes for many people. Um, yeah, I think so. Yeah. What are you doing currently? Right now, now, now I'm not doing anything. Uh, here it's <laughs> national holiday, so <laughs> right now I'm just sitting and relaxing. And I think after this goal, I'll take my daughter out and uh, and go for lunch or something. But um. No, I'm, I'm currently working um, at a smaller water utility um, in Malawi. Um, we're doing a project, a long-term water operator partnership. So that means it's a collaboration between the Dutch utilities and the local utility. And um, through this way of working, we'll, we, we want to improve the performance of the utility. That's maybe the easiest way to formulate it. Um, and improving the performance, it can mean many different things. Um, it can mean that we try and help improve the maintenance procedures. It can mean that we try and help improve legislation around water uh, or help the utility in getting access to funding. 
um, so that they can improve their infrastructure. It can mean that we work with, uh, with leaders, uh, doing leadership programs. Um, it can be many, many different things. And um, I have to say here in, um, in Malawi, we, we focus a lot on improving the operational side. Um, so working a lot on improving maintenance, um, improving boreholes, uh, looking at the, uh, the performance of the boreholes, seeing if we can clean them, those kind of things. So uh, this project is quite operational for me, um, but it's also a lot of fun. And um, that's what we're doing. That's what I'm doing. So uh, you said that you can, uh, you, you started with the technique part, like as a heriologist, and then you move into the management position. So are there any uh, moments that you are really proud of or uh, the most memorable event uh, in, in this, uh, in this time? Um, let's see, in the Netherlands, when I was working in the Netherlands, I was actually quite proud that we managed to set up collaborations uh, between the water utilities and the water boards. So the water boards in the Netherlands are the ones that manage um, the sewage system, the sanitation part, but also manage the surface water uh, system. And originally there was not too much collaboration between those water boards and the water utilities that provide the piped water uh, to the households and industries and everything. But um, at the time that I was a geohydrologist, we started uh, making models, um, groundwater models, and we wanted to make them bigger and bigger, covering bigger areas so that it was easier to determine the impact of um, water abstraction on the surrounding areas. And that meant that we had to collaborate. And um, by the time I stopped working as a geohydrologist, we covered almost the whole part where Fidens was supplying water. And we worked with all the water boards there. And that was actually a lot of fun. I learned a lot, um, a lot about surface water uh, back then, but also the hydrologists I worked from the water boards, they learned a lot about um, all, the, all the tricky things when it comes to abstracting water um, from the ground. And I think setting up that collaboration was actually one of the, the, the things I was most proud of. Uh, yeah, there so that any... was a really... Yeah, really yeah. nice experience for me as well, seeing that collaboration is possible, even though it wasn't uh, it wasn't the normal thing, um, at mm -hmm. least not uh, not really. And um, so that was really nice. But when I look at my current my current job uh, working abroad, I think my most proudest moments are not even so much when we uh, achieve something technical but mostly when we get feedback from utility staff that they learned how to ask questions or think for themselves. Those are the moments that I really like. So when I get the feedback like, hey, you taught me to, to trust that, that my ideas are good as well and that I don't just have to believe the foreigners that come and tell us how things should be done, but that we can question them and that our ideas are good as well. Those are the things that I really like, because for me, those are the moments where I see that my work is making a difference towards achieving a sustainable change within a local water utility. Um, because in the end, when you wanna do it yourself, um, you need to be able to trust yourself. And that goes for a utility. It also goes for a person. Um, being able to, to, to trust that you can do it yourself, it's a really valuable thing. So. Whenever we get feedback along those lines, those are the moments where I'm like, yes, we did well. Yeah, I can totally relate about that. So are there any particular experience uh, as a woman in the water center? So, I mean, the most, uh, I'm, I like your picture of, you know, wearing the safety suit and mm. also working <laughs> in the peace side. I never saw that version. I mean, uh, I know you as a manager. I know you as a you know leader, but I never uh, I never see you as a technical person. So when I yeah. see that picture, I was really impressed, and I realized that oh, Vera is also a hydrologist. So hey, I, I am any, at heart. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> I know, but I just you know forget about that because we are really so good in the leadership position. So are there any particular experience as a technician or as a leader 
uh, in a as a woman in the water sector? I think for me, the, the good thing about working in the Netherlands is that I I never really experienced a lot of downsides of being a woman um, in the water sector. Um, maybe I am just not aware. Uh, maybe I just forget that I'm one amongst all the others. Um, so for me, it's never been a it's never been a weird thing being very often the only woman in a group of men. Um, I've gotten used to it. I never found it weird. I never really experienced a lot of problems with that, but maybe that is also again because I don't I don't notice them. Um, I am not so much aware of hierarchy. So for me, all people are equal. Doesn't matter if you're a manager, if you're a high level manager, or if you're a plumber. I don't care if you're a woman or if you're a man. I just consider everyone equal, and that means that probably I don't notice when people are not treating me as equal. Uh, um, so especially in the Netherlands, I never really had uh, situations where I thought that I had it worse or more tough because I was a woman. Um, so in Netherlands, I never had those things. I, I do remember when going abroad for the first time, um, I got the feeling that people in the utility I worked with back then initially didn't think that I was, I know, smart enough or good enough. But that might just as well have been my age or the red hair that I was <laughs> sporting at the time, like spiky red hair. So that wasn't really very representative. Um, but I also noticed that very soon I was um, able to show that I know enough, it's not a problem. And nowadays, thinking about it more consciously, I think it might even be an advantage being a woman uh, working in a field where there's a lot of men active. Um, maybe it's because I'm a foreign woman working in a country. So I'm not a native in the country, current countries where I work. Um, so maybe that's an advantage um, because I think I am not seen as a threat. I'm not, um, I'm not a dominant male coming to tell some manager or some employee that they need to do it different. Um, that's also not my style. Um, so maybe, maybe it's kind of an advantage nowadays, but it might just as well be the way that I act and not so much about being my gender. So I don't know. For me, it, it's never been a weird thing. I've never given it much thought. So yep. yeah, maybe I'm just privileged. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yep, I think that it all depends on the attitudes and perspective. I mean, I didn't deny that there will be a lot of you know, bad experience uh, in yeah. the water sector as a woman, but at the same time, uh, we also have good experience about that. Yeah, yeah. Thank that's you why I say maybe it's, yep. yeah, that's also why I say maybe it's also because I'm a foreigner, uh, mm -hmm. which is always different. And yeah. because I'm not used to getting negative feedback on my gender in the Netherlands, I never had that. So I don't expect it. And because I'm not from the countries where I work. People mm -hmm. won't say. So maybe I'm in an easy position. I think when you're a Burmese girl in, in working in Myanmar, it's different. People expect you to behave a certain way, but they yep. won't expect me to behave in such a way. So for me, it's never been a disadvantage, but uh -huh. I can indeed imagine that in many of the countries where, where we work, where I work, it's very different if you're from that country. Um, so yeah. So the last question is, uh, are there any recommendation or suggestion or sharing point you would like to give to the younger generation? Uh, I didn't mean that you are a little bit older, but I mean that I you have enough experience <laughs> to suggest. 
I just had a very nice talk with with my coach. I still get coaching, even though I'm older. Um, every once in a while, it's good to get coaching. It's good to um, it's good to have someone um, help you to think about things. So that maybe is even a, a recommendation number one. Um, don't try and do it all by yourself. Also, sometimes allow others to think along with you. But the thing I was discussing with her is how important it is to stay true to yourself, uh, to embrace your own style. So just as you say, like, I'm a little bit not the typical girl. Um, the same goes for me. I, I have a different style than, than some other people, um, especially when I was starting as a manager. I don't have the, the typical manager leadership style. And initially, I thought I should have. So I tried being the tough leader, but that's not me. It's really not me. And um, I am learning more and more to accept that one, I have a different style, but also that that different leadership style uh, allows me to do different kinds of projects. And that allows me to achieve different results. Um, and that that means that my style is useful. Um, and that by using that in a good way, I can achieve more than if I try to imitate someone else. Um, because then I'm not as effective. What I can do, someone else might not be able to do. But what someone else can, I might not be able to do. So embracing your own style, trying to figure out what your own style is, and then using that, trying to find work um, that allows you to use that style or trying to find ways to use your own style, that makes you more effective and more happy in the end. So I think that's, that's one of the most important recommendations I got. And I'm learning to see the value of that one more and more and more every day that finding your style and and using it trying to use it in a good way that's that's the best yeah i totally agree about that i mean at the end of the day we are all we have if we are not you know embrace ourselves there's no point and this is easier said than done but i know i'm learning <laughs> every day <laughs> and this is yeah. all the fun yeah yeah i think that it your is. recommendation is the best for the younger generation Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. It's nice. Yeah. Yeah. So thank you very much, Bia, for joining our podcast. And that brings us to the end of another incredible episode of Women in Water. Thanks all of you for joining us on this enlightening and inspiring journey. I hope you found today's conversation as captivating and empowering as I did. I want to express my deepest gratitude to our amazing guest, Bia, for taking the time to share her wisdom and experience with us. It's individuals like her who inspire us all to keep pushing boundaries and making waves in the water sector. Heartfelt thank you for all of you, my listener. Your support and encouragement mean the world to us. Together, we can create a future where clean and safe water is accessible to all. Until next time, keep riding the waves of inspiration, keep championing the cause, and keep making a positive impact. Remember, we are all water women, and our collective effort can truly change the world. And please do take care of Mukha Cyclone after effort. Be safe, be strong, and be healthy. See you next time. Bye-bye.